Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We will actually wait a couple of minutes. I think it's just two o'clock now. So we're going to wait a couple of minutes and then um, we'll get started. Um, the idea is that we've got two hours here. We're, we're good from two to four. And we're planning to do about an hour and a half of presentation. And then with 30 minutes of questions at the end, um, we'll ask that if you have questions along the way that you put your questions into the chat and we will address them at the end. There's a, there's a lot of material that we wanna cover. Um, so we'll address the questions at the end. Uh, before anyone asks the question, this session is being recorded and it will be available if your colleagues or if you just want to view it again um, on the Office of Research website, CUNY Office of Research website. Also, we will be send sending the slides around. So everyone who's been who's registered um, we'll also receive a copy of the slides. We will also have another session on Thursday. Thursday session is from 10 until noon, but they're identical. So um, if you're a real glutton for punishment and you want to sit through this twice, you're welcome. But um, it'll be the same session repeated on Thursday. Um, I'll, I'll, we didn't talk about this team, but I will introduce um, the, the first speaker. So I will give a general overview and then each person will talk about their research, their, um, their division and the, the activities of their division. Um, but I'll ask each person to introduce themselves. So, uh, so the group will will have a better idea of, of who you guys are. Uh, I'll give it until 2.05. So we still have people signing in. So let me first just share my screen so that we can know that everybody's in the right spot. I don't actually see the time anymore. Um, so I do, I do want to make sure that we get through this in the allotted time period. So I don't see the number changing that much. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first, just by introducing myself. So I'm Rose Wesson. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Research here in the CUNY Office of Research. Uh, I've been here at CUNY, they call it the CUNYverse, um, for nine years now. Um, I started off as Associate Dean for Research at City College of New York in the School of Engineering. Um, I, I spent about five years there and then I was Associate Provost for Research at City College uh, for about three years before assuming this role in December of 2023. Um, I'm a chemical engineer by training, but as I as I and, and the team give this presentation, we wanna make sure that everybody realizes that research is not just STEM. Research is across all disciplines. So um, I, I say this often that somehow, even though I must have these invisible equations on my face, I'm talking, when I talk about research, I'm not just talking about engineering. I'm not just talking about science. I'm talking about research in all disciplines. So I'm gonna get started. 
I believe it's now 205. So as I stated, we will, I'll give an Office of Research overview, but the various programs within the Office of Research will also talk about their areas. I'll come back here at the end and talk more about the Council of Administrators for Research, the grants offices that are on your campuses, a little bit about grantsmanship and how to find grant opportunities, and then also address questions at the end. So um, the other thing that I say often, and people in my team are going to say, when you got, how many times are you going to have to say that, Rose? But you guys haven't heard it. So when I introduce myself, um, people sometimes ask, oh, you work for the Graduate Center. And it's like, no, I don't work for the Graduate Center. I work with the Graduate Center, just like I work with Lehman or John Jay or uh, BMCC. I work with all the colleges within CUNY, but I don't work for any particular college. And then they say, oh, well, then you must work for the Research Foundation. I've heard about the Research Foundation. No, the CUNY Office of Research is separate from the Research Foundation. And we'll talk about that a little bit more at, toward the end of the presentation. But to just to show you where we fit within CUNY, EBC Hensel, the Executive Vice Chancellor, is Wendy Hensel. She's the University Provost. And under her are all of these offices, one of which is research. So I also say that this is the Office of Academic Affairs. So there's academic and faculty affairs, there's student affairs, there's affairs affairs, but we're research. And that's where we reside within CUNY. Whenever you hear me speak, I will talk about our research expenditures. And this slide shows the research expenditures throughout CUNY that are captured by the Research Foundation. Um, all of these separate areas I won't go into. The important part is the total grants and contracts. So you see right now for FY23 is the red bar. We're at about $550 million of research and sponsored program activities expenditures. Um, we are, we went through a downturn during COVID, but for FY23, we're at 550. Mm -hmm. Our FY24 numbers look like. See you later today. I have a reunion with the research uh, oh, okay. or understand I ask, Can I ask, can I yeah. ask yeah. everybody? I, I will yourself? write these. <laughs> um, Christina, <laughs> like, uh, can you I write everyone? Them. Thank you. Um. So our FY24 expenditures, we know will be over $600 million. So we are still growing. We're continuing. We've got a positive trend in terms of research throughout CUNY. I chart here. This is the Office of Research, not meant so that you can identify who's who and where's where but it's just to show that we have a lot of activities within the Office of Research. And we have a number of people that are here to serve the, community, the CUNY community in the Office of Research. What I do wanna concentrate on, however, are these three areas, research integrity and compliance, research development and programs, and innovation and entrepreneurship. Those are the three areas that we will talk mostly about during this presentation. And those are the three areas that we've grouped the Office of Research in order to serve the faculty, the students, the staff of CUNY. So I'm gonna first turn it over and I'm gonna try this. I'm gonna first turn it over to Alan, to Alan Shee. He's the University Executive Director of Research and Innovation, and he's going to talk about the programs. It was great when it was just a few people, Alan. 
he's going to talk about, there you are. He's going to talk about the um, programs and uh, activities under the research and innovation. Alan, I think you have control. Thank you, Abby Sewesson. Um, so welcome on board um, to CUNY. Um, my name is Alan Shi. Um, I have the privilege to work with three teams uh, in research and innovation. Um, so I would briefly introduce you um, the um, these three groups, research and development and, um, and programs and technology commercialization office, as well as industry and applied research IARs. So if we started with the bullets on the right, um, on the research development side of it, um, we are trying to provide networking and training opportunities for faculties uh, or research staff and students uh, in the team science areas. And team science is basically um, an opportunity for the faculties of different disciplines to work together, to come together and brainstorm uh, novel ideas together. Um, we also provide view this kind of opportunity as the opportunity for faculties to get to know each other um, and provide you with a networking opportunity as well. Uh, unfortunately, we just had this uh, team science uh, training workshop uh, last week. Um, so many of you probably missed that, um, but we will continue to arrange such opportunities. Um, in terms of research development, so we also try to, we, we are putting a team together and um, to identify the large uh, opportunities and provide the services and coordinations to the faculties. So if you are working on a large proposal, um, please do not hesitate to contact me so that we can help you to provide uh, support and um, and uh, help you to coordinate or, or even identify expertise across CUNYs uh, so that making your proposal more stellar and um, uh, strong in, in terms of the uh, applications. There are some internal and external funding opportunities. Um, we will eventually, um, uh, gradually, you will probably start to see emails coming to you uh, notifying you some funding opportunities from external uh, sponsors. But there are uh, many internal funding opportunities and I will leave that to um, Ron and Effie to, um, to give you more details um, about these internal funding opportunities. There is a research event support efforts that we are trying to establish and we started to provide some support to some events already. If you are organizing a conference or some gathering uh, for research discussions or uh, conferences uh, in New York City or um, on CUNY campuses, please uh, let us know and uh, we can help you to provide some administrative support uh, such as uh, registrations, on-site checkings, and other administrative supports uh, and reserve the ven venue, identify the proper venues uh, across CUNY campuses and so forth. So the idea is to lessen your workload uh, for organizing these research events um, and be more focused on the program itself. Um, in terms of research administration, so we, we are the office that liaises with the uh, research foundations. And uh, if you run into any specific issues uh, in terms of uh, managing your grants, administers through the research foundations, please let us know so that we can help you to, um, to make the process, post-award uh, process to be easier. We are very much um, focus on the student research opportunities and I will let the RTP, RTP teams to give you more information about that. Um, we want to uh, provide internships or um, research opportunity for our CUNY students. In terms of uh, entrepreneurships, um, John 
from the IAR group will give you more details about the iCorps sites program that he is running with his team. And um, we will also uh, hear from him a lot of um, training opportunities, short course opportunities, uh, so, so that uh, helped you to uh, have more knowledge in terms of entrepreneurial uh, activities. On the left side is the TCO, uh, Technology Commercialization Office, uh, directed by Doug. Um, we want to help you from your research outcomes, uh, identify the uh, inventions, and then through the CUNY invention disclosure process managed by TCOs, uh, we'll be able to turn that into intellectual properties. And hopefully from the intellectual property, we will also be able to lead to either a startup um, or uh, licensing out to uh, commercial companies for the commercial um, activities. So all these are within the research and innovation teams um, um, supported by these three groups. And uh, before I hand it over to, um, uh, to them for additional uh, detailed discussions, I just want to let you know that there is a workshop coming up next Friday, uh, September 27th. Um, it is coordinated by the Nice Tech, which is a nonprofit corporation funded by the state. Um, they are going to provide uh, some entrepreneurship workshops. And within this uh, first event, we will have our um, affiliated uh, attorney in IP laws uh, to talk about the IP uh, basics. And TCO staff will also uh, talk about uh, more details uh, about their services and uh, CUNY IP policies, even though Doug is going to talk uh, some today. And um, oops. the last one is the for next like to talk about their services uh, provided to the universities. And uh, I would strongly encourage you to, uh, to register. And I will put the registration link uh, in the chat so that you can register if your schedule permits. Uh, it will be only a two hours. You can uh, participate either in the through the Zoom or you can come to this location in their office there uh, in downtown. And um, we will be meeting there and so it's a hybrid format. Uh, the last one. So the next presentation will be done by Effie and Ron from the RDP, followed by uh, Doug from TCO and John from IAR. So um, Rose, can you take the control back? I don't know why it's keep advancing. Hi, I'm just gonna start talking because we're trying to keep this short and sweet. <laughs> so I am um, Effie McLaughlin. I am Director of Grants and Research Programs in the Office of Research. I'm also a product of CUNY. I have a PhD in political science and I've been working in the Office of Research for more than a decade now. And during that time, I have um, developed and administered, uh, you know, many er internal seed grant programs, um, research development activities, and also as Ron will talk about in a little bit, undergraduate research programs. So I just wanna start out with, cause I know that a lot of this, a lot of you are hopefully interested in this and it's always, you know, it's such a pleasure to be able to connect with um, new faculty. You wanna know about what internal seed funding programs we have within the university that helps you, you know, jumpstart your research programs and hopefully, um, get external funding. So the first one, so these are the ones that we are offering this year, this academic year, so fall and spring. Um, the Junior Faculty Research Award in Science and Engineering is live now. And actually, as you can see, the deadline is next week. But if you are interested in this, it's a fairly short application process. And a lot of it revolves around, as you can see, in the past, the J-Phrase was more sort of a, a straight up, um, resource award to you to advance your career. But this year, because we're trying to explicitly tie it to building your uh, grant writing skills and hopefully being um, competitive for the career award, which if you are in the sciences, hopefully you know about the career award. Um, so we've merged our J-Phrase program with um, a, a, 
a boot camp that teaches you or sort of you work collaboratively to develop your career award um, with um, a, a boot camp leader at the Advanced Science Research Center. And so what we've done for the program this year is that we've sort of rather focusing on discretionary funds to help you advance your research in terms of equipment or whatever, we're trying to focus on optimizing your time. So the way that we've structured the program this year is that the grant includes one course release, which will hopefully give you some time, one month of summer salary, and then $5,000 in discretionary funds. So, um, oh, I also wanna say at the outset, when we send you this slide deck, we will hot link all these programs to where you can find out more about the programs and also apply for them on our website. So you will have this as a resource. Um, but also please, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. Um, so we're also going to be relaunching. We've done this in the past as part of our, our undergraduate research programming. We're launching the Research in the Classroom Grant Program. And this is especially exciting for me and Ron because this is about broadening um, student participation in, in authentic undergraduate research experiences. And many of you might be familiar with course-based undergraduate research experiences, but that's what this is um, a program that supports that. And so we're looking for faculty who can integrate aspects of their own research into their, their curriculum. Um, and that can be a module, it can be a field experience, it could be, you know, we're looking for faculty to be creative about figuring out the best ways to integrate to expose, you know, to enable their students in their classroom to have um, access to authentic research experiences. And that also is gonna be launching this winter. Our sort of time frame thinking about this is we'll make the award in uh, the winter and then you'll have um, a, a semester to plan. So you'll have spring 2024 to plan your course and then you'll launch the course in fall of 25. That's sort of how we're thinking for the time frame for this. Um, and then we're also, uh, oh, and I should say the research in the classroom is open to across disciplines. I mean, we've funded people in the English programs, we've funded in people's psychology, theater. <laughs> so this is also open to, to faculty um, in both STEM and humanities and social sciences. Now the book completion award is um, a grant program, one of our more popular grant programs that is also, it's, it, it's ex it explicitly um, is looking to fund faculty in the humanities and the social sciences. And it's about if you're working on a publishable book manuscript. And we encourage um, faculty who are both, you know, have already, um, you know, have a contract with a publisher and are just in their final stages in terms of editing and copyright, you know, permissions. And we're also looking to capture faculty that might be more at the submission stage or the prospectus stage of a book manuscript. So we sort of try to balance that. Um, and that's going to be launching in the spring. And one of the things that Ron and I had done in the past is we had a really nice faculty development um, symposium celebration. We bring all the book completion award winners back and we talk about where they are with their, with their book projects. And then also we'll bring in a panel. In the past, we brought in panels of editors from, um, um, from you know, academic presses, we brought in panels of agents, so, so faculty can figure out how to secure an agent and find about pursuing those avenues. So we're hoping to be able also to relaunch that. And then um, this year, the other uh, grant that we're gonna be running in the spring is with one of our um, partners, the Hudson River Park Trust, um, which is, you, sh you should all check it out, Hudson River Park Trust, Hudson River Park is nine miles along the Hudson River, basically from, for those of you that know your community geography, it runs basically from Burma Manhattan Community College up to John Jay College on 59th Street. Um, and this is actually a really wonderful program because we very explicitly partner with the Hudson River Park Trust. They help us develop um, the, the, the grant program. They also review it. And that's important because the projects that the faculty propose um, must be aligned with the Parks Estrin Sanctuary Management Plan. So it's fairly explicitly linked to the park's research goals in terms of managing and sustaining the, um, the Hudson River Park area. Um, and that will also, that will be launching in the spring. So Ron, if you can just go to the next slide, are you in there? So I really, I just quickly want to say, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. These are the grants that we plan to run next academic year. And we're trying to switch up our programming a little bit. So um, we will, in, this, in academic year 25, 26, we'll be running our interdisciplinary research grant program, which is our longest running 
um, internal seed grant funding program. It's been it's been more than 30 rounds, so it predates all of us. <laughs> but this is more sort of your standard um, research program. However, we do require that it be collaborative and interdisciplinary because one of the main goals of our office is to encourage collaboration across the colleges and across departments and across colleges. Um, and then also the planning grant program, which is focused on, so this is intended to uh, seed and support large, you know, multidisciplinary, multi-college center type proposals. So we're looking at, you know, a center for sustainability. So the, the large center type proposals that the NSF and the NIH um, often sponsor, if you're familiar with those types of things. Um, and we will also be running that next year. Um, and then again, we're, we're hoping to run the Book Completion Award, and also we have our ongoing relationship with the Hudson River Park Trust. Um, let me do the next slide. I also uh, direct, co-lead a couple special initiatives, which are both research development and also collaborative research oriented. Um, one of them is the CUNY Climate Consortium. Um, and that is, it's something that we're sort of trying to get off the ground. We've only really been directing it or running it for about a year. And there is um, a large group of faculty that work in environmental science, climate science, multidisciplinary across the colleges who participate in the steering and planning of this initiative. And we had um, a university wide Expo last year, so faculty get the opportunity to meet each other. And we're also working on a few other angles in terms of funding, in terms of we're seeking some federal funding for this. We're also um, pursuing um, possibly getting official consortial status through the Board of Trustees. So this is a new initiative, but it's also a very exciting initiative. And a lot of people are thinking about and working in this area. So we're trying to get um, people to talk to each other that all do climate research. Um, OK, next to non, I'm sorry, I see there's a question about non-TT faculty. Do you mean non-STEM faculty? Non-tenure track. Oh, non-tenure track. Um, so <laughs> that is actually a good question. In the past, we had offered some of our internal grant programs to lecturers and non-tenure track faculty. I do not think that any of it will be offered to non-tenure track faculty this year. Um, but that is a good question. <laughs> um, so I just, again, I just want to be very quick. I just wanted to throw this up. I'm not gonna talk about this, but one of the main things that we're doing now with the CUNY Climate Consortium is, um, is Climate Week is coming up, which hopefully many of you know. And so we have a, a sort of a roster of events that are happening across CUNY that faculty can participate in. And you can also see this. I encourage you to check out our CUNY Climate Consortium website and also get on the CUNY Climate Consortium listserv if you're interested in finding out more about this. So last slide, Ron. Um, so one of the other um, initiatives that I've been heading up from the Office of Research is the Public Interest Technology Initiative. And this is um, in part, well, we are, CUNY became um, a member of the Public Interest Technology University of Network, University Network in 2019. And we've been collaborating with New America and other universities across the country in establishing public interest tech as a field and also working on public, uh, projects related to public interest tech research, workforce development, educational models. Um, so I, I also want to mention, so I mean, you can read the slide and also check out the website to learn more about it. Um, we have a number of NSF grants that are related to public interest tech. Um, we also just received a challenge grant. One of the, the programs that we built from our office is a public interest technology apprenticeship program that we are working with um, a community-based organization called Beta NYC and teaching students how to do open access mapping in city parks. Um, so there is, um, you can see the last bullet, there is um, a challenge grant program that we also, that faculty, if you're interested in, the, in this area of public interest tech, can apply for. And that also launches in the spring. So look out for that, but I will also announce that through all our research channels. So I think you're up, Ron. Okay. So it's great to see everyone. My name is Ron Nerio. I'm a director of research programs in uh, the same unit as Effie. 
and I'm here to speak about the undergraduate research programs. Our unit runs a number of these programs and they do keep growing. And we'd love to see new faculty uh, become interested in the programs and potentially serve as mentors. So the first one and the largest one is the CUNY Research Scholars Program that operates at all 10 of the associate degree programs. Uh, it is primarily a STEM-based program, but it has increasingly expanded into social and behavioral sciences. Uh, this funds research experiences for in, in apprentice st apprenticeship style uh, programs for uh, undergrad students who work very closely with a mentor and then present their research after one year of conducting the research uh, in the summer. Uh, that program has been around for 11 years. Uh, it's one of our uh, most successful and is kind of putting CUNY on the map for associate degree style research. Uh, very recently, just this year, we received funding from the state to expand the Research Scholars Program into the four-year colleges. That's the CUNY Immersive Research Experience. At this stage, that program is still a pilot program. Uh, we, we're not entirely sure how, how long the funding will continue in that program, um, but it's, it's quite similar in the sense that uh, students at four-year colleges spend uh, about 400 hours uh, working on a research project under the guidance of a faculty mentor and then they present their research at the end of a year. They receive uh, fairly significant funding for this. The mentor receives also a small amount of funding and um, may uh, mentor up to three students in that program. A subset of that program is the, the Climate Scholars Program. So at one of each of the 11 colleges, uh, a student is designated as a climate scholar and works on a cl climate related project as well as uh, conducts an internship with a local partner. We are still recruiting mentors uh, into the climate scholars program. And I should say about all of these programs that uh, I it, it we love to see new blood in the mentorship as some mentors have been around for uh, many years uh, like to sort of pass the baton of the mentorship over to uh, to new faculty as they come. Um, we also uh, this is the second year that we're running the transfer to STEM student success program. Uh, this is uh, specifically to address, um, the significant problem of students transferring from uh, a community college or any other associate degree program into a four-year college and, and experiencing the, the kind of transfer slump that occurs because they're in a new environment, uh, that environment doesn't have the same sort of supportive structure as their community colleges did. And uh, what we do is we choose the top four colleges that CRISP students transfer to. And uh, in recent years, that has been City, Hunter, Lehman, and Queens. And uh, I, I, let's see, that is our fifth program is the Valet Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship. Uh, this is a program that Effie directs and uh, engages students, students across the, the CUNYverse. All 18 colleges are eligible to apply, uh, and they, um, uh, they all engage in a summer research uh, project at the ASRC. And uh, that program just concluded and had its symposium, which was uh, quite a great big celebration. They bond uh, closely with their mentors and with each other. We get great feedback from that one. Um, the next one and the last one here is not a program uh, so much as a celebration, an event that we hold. Uh, now it'll be in its third year. We held the first CUNY-wide celebration of undergraduate research two years ago. And uh, students at all 22 colleges with mentored undergrad research programs nominate students to present their research 
Uh, it's a very large uh, kind of festive event. Uh, we also uh, recruit students from dance, music, and theater programs to provide uh, the, it's not just the entertainment, but to also show uh, their own development and their own arts. So uh, these are the undergraduate research programs and events that we run in our office. And our last slide here is just, if you would like information uh, about any of these programs, not only will they be hot linked in the slides that go out, so you can check out the webpage, but these are the addresses of myself, Ron Nerio, and uh, Effie McLaughlin. And that's it for the RDP unit. Welcome everybody, I'm Doug Adams, Director of Technology Commercialization Office. Can I go to the next slide? Yeah. So my office, we work closely with uh, the CUNY inventors. We have over 500 CUNY inventors. Uh, one third of those are graduate students. Um, we do not claim any ownership on intellectual property for undergraduates, but many of our graduate students work closely with our professors and work hand in hand in the lab and on their grants. And so we treat them as inventors and, and, and we work to commercialize their technology. So like Alan said, we, we like to take your research outcomes, your discoveries, your inventions, and, and, and find a way to commercialize that. Uh, we, we will certainly try to license it to an existing company, but because so many of your technologies are early stage, we encourage our faculty to start a company. CUNY does not start these companies ourselves. You do, the inventor, and then you come back to my office and we work out uh, what, what I'll describe later as a, a licensing arrangement in order for you to commercialize it. Uh, next slide. So I work with uh, all CUNY colleges throughout the entire system and uh, we collaborate you know, quite effectively and very well with many other departments. You're going to hear from John Blaho next uh, with i -Corps. Uh, So we work with uh, i -Corps. We work with uh, the Research Foundation. Rose mentioned the Research Foundation. The reason why uh, the reason why we work with the Research Foundation is that intellectual property and patents are actually assigned to the Research Foundation. So I'll, you know, when the time is right, I'll explain uh, why you have to assign the rights to the Research Foundation and not to CUNY. But that allows me, although I'm on the CUNY side, it allows me to market your uh, inventions to, to companies and to your own startup company. So you may have heard, uh, uh, you know, these various forms of intellectual property. Patents is the most uh, common one, most popular one, but it's not the it's not the only one. It's sometimes not, not even the most important one. We do trademarks, we do copyright, um, we even take your software code and we will register the software code, and that has certain commercial advantages. And lastly, the last one mentioned is know-how. That's extremely important. There's a lot of information that doesn't go into a patent per se. It's just general data and, and, and your specific techniques. And that's very valuable to a, to a company. And so we, are, we make sure to license that properly. Uh, next slide. Doug, you have control. Oh, okay. So we have a, a IP policy. It's quite generous compared to other institutions. I don't know what you've experienced in the past, but we roughly share it 50-50. Uh, um, when we license something before I distribute any revenue, yes, I do like to get reimbursed for any costs that we spend. Uh, for example, to get a US patent, I probably need to spend anywhere from ten to $20,000 per patent. But after that, um, um, that's pretty much it. Yes, I do keep a small amount to, to help run the office, but 50% goes to you, 25% uh, will go to your department, and then 25% will go to the Office of Research. I included this slide because if you work with companies, and many of you uh, do or you will soon do, the companies are, the first question they're going to ask is, who owns the intellectual property that may come out of that research grant? And so we have just a standard boilerplate language. Um, 
that we uh, negotiate with companies, most companies agree with this language or some variation of that. So although you'll be working with the research foundation on your sponsored research agreements, if the company raises any questions or concerns about IP, our, our RF lawyers are very good about contacting me and trying to find uh, suitable language that addresses the company's needs and, and your needs as well. Generally speaking, anything that you create, you're going to be the sole inventor and you will sign the rights to CUNY. Anything the company does by themselves, of course, they own. But if, if by chance, and it happens quite a bit, if you work jointly with a company, we have uh, a procedure in place to, to handle this joint intellectual property. And we give the company, the sponsoring company, the first option to acquire that IP. So TCO, we have many functions. Uh, yes, the um, process very often begins with invention disclosure, but even before that, don't hesitate to call me and, and, and just explain what you wanna do, what, you've, what you think you've discovered and what you think you want to do in terms of commercializing your possible invention. My office, we negotiate uh, confidential disclosure agreements. These are very important. Before you talk to a company, um, you wanna make sure and, and the company is going to want to make sure that you have what is called a confidential disclosure agreement so you can confidently share all the details of your, of your invention with each other. My office, we handle these, these material transfer agreements. Many of you may be working with companies in the future, and you're going to want to send out materials or receive materials. So before you do that, please contact me. We have a quick material transfer agreement intake form. We just want to ask some basic questions. Um, my office, we can process, you know, 95% of these without, you know, without, um, without bothering you. But every once in a while, there's some nuance so the companies want something specific. So I, I may reach out to you and, and ask for your help. Um, but I'll do that when the time is right. Uh, like I said, it, it, uh, we filed the, these, these um, patent documents. What we normally do is we'll file an invention disclosure or we'll, we'll, we'll file a provisional patent application. And these are, it's like a stakeholder. It, it preserves your rights for one year. We don't have to do anything for one year um, after that provisional, except to, to talk to the market. Uh, these other agreements, uh, licensing agreements and, and term sheets, um, we can talk about that when the time is right. Interinstitutional agreements, um, it's not unusual for you to collaborate with another university or, or company, and we always put together what we call an agreement. Somebody has to take the lead in, in filing the intellectual property, and, and someone has to take the lead in marketing, and all that is documented in these agreements. Letters of support. So many of our companies uh, apply for these SBIRs, STTRs, and one thing that, that, that they require from me is some kind of letter of support. So our process is pretty straightforward. Um, come to me with an invention disclosure, I'll file the provisional patent, um, and then we'll discuss collaboratively about the best way forward. Uh, John will discuss uh, i -Core, Next, uh, that's a fantastic program that'll really um, open up our eyes in terms of what the potential market is for, the, for this technology. Like I said, we have 12 months after we file this provisional patent to figure out what we wanna do. At the end of the 12 months, we have to make a go, no go decision. Uh, are we gonna file a US patent or are we possibly gonna expand upon that and file international protection? Companies always want to know, you know, what, what goes into the license agreement, um, wh what's the value. The value of these technologies are, you know, very much determined on a case by case basis. Uh, but we always charge some kind of upfront license fee. We always seek to get the patent costs reimbursed. We seek some kind of royalties, and these are royalties on net sales. And of course, this happens, you know, years from now. Uh, milestone payments are just that. If, if a certain event occurs in the future, such as somebody makes a prototype, then they pay something to us. Equity, many of our startup companies, we take equity. 
Again, RF CUNY will hold the equity. For example, you know, something in the 5% range. Um, and when the time is right, if we ever sell it, then I would disperse that money according to the IP policy. So we have about 28, 29 startup companies and we have three or four other faculty that, that are thinking of starting companies, they just haven't yet. Um, covering all sorts of technologies, diagnostics, therapeutics, software, chemistry technologies, um, you, know, you, you name it, we're doing it. It does take a few years to, to actually flesh out the technology to make a viable prototype to actually enter the market. And we're at the point now, collectively, if you look at all 28 companies right now, we have close to 100 full-time employees. We have companies that have left New York City to move into New Jersey or some other state because they've just grown so large. And they should be hitting the market probably in the next you know, six months or so. To so take one Doug, example. I'm going to ask in the oh, okay. interest of time, can mm -hmm. we just uh, ask the, the audience to read through these examples yeah. and, and thank you. Yeah, my contact information, if you have any questions, just please reach out to me. Thank you. Sorry. John, you're up next. All right, thanks, Rose. And thanks, Doug and Effie and Ron for setting us up. Um, how's everyone doing? We're approaching the halfway mark. Is people still with us? Let me advance the slide here. Pretty good, thank you, Claudia. You should have control, John. There it goes. All right, so for the sake of time, I'm just going to go through three quick topics. And there's a lot of content in this deck. And similar to what Effie and Ron did, you will get these slides. So I'm not gonna go through the detail of all the slides. And as I said, I know it's towards the end of the presentation. I wanna focus on this first part, the innovation review. And if there's something that you should take away from the talk, it should be this first section. You can always go back, you'll have the slides and we can talk about the later parts at another time. All right, so this is this so-called Valley of Death. In the chat, can anyone tell me if they have ever heard of the Valley of Death? Yes or no, just in the chat. Oh, I'm on a timer, it seems. No, oh, that was me, I'm sorry. Okay, no, okay, I see one, no. All right, so based on the people who've replied, it seems like most people have not heard about the Valley of Death. So if you look at the lower right-hand side, what Ron, Effie, and Doug spoke about was what the National Science Foundation calls foundational research. The reason we're all doing research is to get to the other side, to help society. But if you look at the resources, the funding, all the things it takes to go from your foundational resource to helping society, there's this gap in the middle. That's called the Valley of Death. So if people have not heard about the Valley of Death, has anybody ever heard of the term i -Corps? It has been mentioned a couple of times today. Has anybody, has anybody heard that i -Corps, Innovation Corps? All right, so I'm not seeing anything, so I'll assume no. If you look at the lower part of this curve, foundational research, proof of concept, prototype, prototype development. So the National Science Foundation created this, these programs, oh, okay, so this has been combined, um, called i -Corps. And there's also something called the Partnership for Innovation. And then there are other things called SBIR grants, that's what Doug mentioned, that were designed by the National Science Foundation to actually bridge this gap, going from foundational research to benefiting society. So this is where we help. CUNY i -Corps works in the i -Corps part, the PFI part, and then there's another part of our group, which is called the New York City Innovation Hotspot, which assists innovators getting 
to that NSF phase one, phase two. Later on, the New York City Innovation Hotspot can help you partner with people outside of the CUNYverse, such as uh, manufacturer, manufacturing extension partnerships, things like this that would help your company grow. So let's quickly go through the i process. So I've mentioned CUNY i -Core. The target for CUNY i is you, CUNY faculty. You may also have students, you may have postdocs working with you, but we're really trying to focus on faculty. CUNY i does info sessions, it does introductory, introductory training. And the goal is after that, if the idea has potential, we can get you a $50,000 grant from the National Science Foundation to go through i -Core. At that point, you're gonna be talking to Doug, as he just mentioned. If you're a go after getting that $50,000 grant, we may start thinking about forming a company. We may place you in a CUNY network incubator, and then the hotspot will help you get that SBIR grant. No one had mentioned it, but there's actually something at the Advanced Science Research Center called the Center for Advanced Technology, which actually gives you matching funds. If you win an SBIR grant and you do research back into the lab as a sponsored project, the CAT will actually match the funding. So this is the cycle that you can participate in. We're gonna come back to this at the very end, but you're just at the beginning. So from this point on, this is what I want you to remember. From this point on, we're gonna go pretty quickly through the slides just to orient you. So when you wanna come back and look at these slides, you'll know where on the cycle you fit. So the first thing I wanna talk about, sorry, is i -Corps, the National i -Corps. And I'm, now I'm just gonna highlight the, the, the areas that are bolded. Um, i -Corps is about experiential entrepreneurship. The goal is to teach academics whether or not there's any commercial interest in your discovery. The key here is you can get a $50,000 National Science Foundation grant to do this. Eligibility is you have to organize a team. You have to have a technology that the NSF is interested in. And in order to get that $50,000, you either have to have federally funded research or you can go through one of our introductory programs. So that means every single person on this call is eligible for this program. I mentioned the hotspot. The hotspot is supported by the state of New York. It's a regional network. Its purpose is to increase the innovation pipeline in New York State. The most important thing for you is that if you do form a company, the hotspot can actually give you tax credits. That would be corporate taxes for your company, personal income taxes in certain instances, and then any sales tax, New York State sales tax that your startup would incur, you can actually ask for a refund from the state. So remember, keep this in the back of your mind when you get to that stage. Another thing that the hotspot does, Doug mentioned that a lot of our faculty win SBIR grants, small business innovation grants. The hotspot runs training and it runs coaching and mentoring on how to win these grants. So we're setting you up for success doing this. And how does this work? So let's assume you've gone through the i process. You're a go. You feel that there is a commercial pull for your discovery. You would form a company at one of our incubators you would talk to Doug and you would lock in the IP either with a uh, option agreement or ideally a you know exclusive licensing deal. We would help you submit your SBIR grant. When you win the grant, you would then sponsor research. So hopefully the people who are running your company are your students, a postdoc, someone else you know who, who's familiar with the technology and they would actually the research dollars back into your lab. And the CAT would actually sweeten the deal by giving you New York State matching funds to increase the success of the project. If you do this, you would be eligible for tax benefits. So the supplies that the company buys, you would not be paying New York State taxes. 
we could actually get you in something called Startup New York if you're really growing, and then eventually you're going to be a revenue-based company. This is the trajectory. But let's go back to the cycle. Your faculty. At most, you should be thinking about, might you be interested in doing an introductory i training program? Let me give you a couple of examples of some faculty who were in the exact same place you're in and where they've ended up. Meet Mungai. We first met Mungai when she participated in a program that we ran with three HBCU colleges in North Carolina. Mungai participated in that introductory course. Based on her experience in that course, she was awarded an NSF i -Corps grant. However, the technology had not matured enough yet to form a company. So we worked with her to win what is called the Partnership for Innovation Grant. So she's currently, and that was just awarded this past year. So her next step might be forming a company and doing uh, an SBIR grant. Let me give you another case study. Meet Z Gang. Z Gang was the faculty lead, the PI, on one of the very first national i -Corps grants that CUNY had. I think it was number two. Notice the year. That was almost 10 years ago. Over 10 years ago, sorry. Again, the technology wasn't quite ready to form a company. So with our help, Z Gang was awarded a Partnership for Innovation grant in 2018. As part of these Partnership for Innovations, you can get additional funding, another $50,000, to go into the National i -Corps program. After this training program, the technology was mature enough that they did form a company. And just two weeks ago, that company was awarded a uh, STTR, which is a uh, small business technology transfer grant, which means that the company works very, very closely with the faculty member. So if you were following closely and you're adding up the money here, there's over a million dollars that went into a research idea just with this one student. So if there's a takeaway for all of you, the research idea, the project that you might take into our pipeline could result in almost $1.5 million of new research funding coming into your laboratory. And it provides workforce development in career training for your students because they will be running companies and managing the money flow back into your laboratory. So keep that in your mind. And let's go back to new opportunities. So what are we gonna, what can you do? So what I'm gonna tell you is you had an introduction, don't think about this. We will come back to you sometime between midterms and finals. And we will we're going to start outreach for our next introductory course. And that course is going to take place in the winter session, but you know, in January. So it's a very quick course. It's an accelerated two-week program. It will give you an opportunity to talk to potential end users for your idea. And teams can be one or more individuals. So what I'm telling everyone on the call is you, with an idea, can participate in a two-week training program and determine the potential for this training program. And with that, I think I'm going to give it back to someone else. So again, feel free to reach out to us. The best way to get contact information is on the website and then follow us on LinkedIn. Thanks everyone and good luck. So Fanny, you're up next and I'm going to try to give control to you, but you can start. Okay. Um, I'm Fan Annaver. I'm a university research compliance officer, and I'm talking about the Office for Research Integrity and Compliance. And I'm not talking about money, as the previous people were mostly talking about. This is really to make sure that you know that we are a resource to help you with all of the rules. Those of you who've done research know there are a lot of rules. And it's not as if in this one 10 minute presentation, you're gonna learn all the rules. The, my goal is that you will remember 
that under certain circumstances, there's some rules you have to follow and that the research integrity and compliance team is here to help make sure that you follow the rules. And so the mission is to foster an environment where research is conducted with integrity and in compliance with federal, state, and local regulations, CUNY policies, and ethical standards. And the compliance part is that we create and implement and educate you about policies and procedures and oversure, oversee the quality assurance activities. And the research integrity is providing training and support for research and administrators as we collectively foster a culture of research integrity. And research integrity is something that um, you probably started hearing about the scientific method in fourth grade. And it's something that just as you have done research throughout your career, I'm sure you've seen it modeled. So um, as I say, we're here primarily in a support situation and there are various different parts that I'm gonna go through and they're divided differently among the college and the Office of the Research Integrity and Compliance. Uh, again, you don't have to memorize it. You're going to get these slides. There are going to be links to our websites. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is um, the conflict of interest. Uh, so, so conflict of interest, export control, human research protection program, research agreements, research integrity, and sponsored projects. So the Conflict of interest is a requirement that investigators must submit a significant financial interest disclosure for every proposal or award for external support. And if a significant financial interest qualifies as a financial conflict of interest, then there is a conflict of interest committee that will review this and may require a management plan. And so each college has a college conflict officer that re reviews the financial interest disclosures at the college grants officers are the ones that ensure that the disclosures are submitted. And then uh, we have a, a team contact is Lisa Peralta, who uh, will assist the college conflict officer and manages the uh, conflict of interest committee meetings. So this one is kind of automatic because your grants officer is not going to let you submit something until you've uh, completed the disclosure. The, uh, the next one that I'm going to talk about is export control. Um, some of you may or may not have heard about export control. This is something where the federal government has an interest in protecting the technology for, uh, from uh, getting into the wrong hands of certain um, state actors that we think are uh, not operating the same integrity that we expect. And so this has export control has to do with collaborations and movement of material outside of the United States. And there's something called deemed export where someone who is a non-US person, even if they're physically in the US, if they get some of these protected uh, information or materials, would that would be also considered an export, even if it never leaves the United States. So we, um, the export control is, covers international travel, non-US collaborators, even within the US, research with export control implications and other research security and foreign influence concerns. So this is something where there's not that much that is impacted by it, but it's uh, very important to know that this is something that needs to be screened. Um, so yes, if, if I saw the question about a non-US person working in CUNY, and yes, that would be something that would require the export control analysis. Almost all of the export control analyses end up uh, saying that we don't need to do something to manage it, but it's very important that we do these to see the few cases where there is some kind of a management. And each college has an export control administrator, 
and then uh, Angela Pilla is our uh, Rick team contact, uh, and her email is there, and there's the link to the website. So you can use um, Angela as a first point of contact or your college export control administrator with any questions. And again, in this very brief presentation, we can't make you an expert on research uh, export control. We just need you to be aware that there's some rules that you need to follow. The Human Research Protection Program, um, for those of you who have done human research at other institutions, you're probably aware it, um, you talk about the IRB. And again, if research involves human subjects, then the there has to be review by the CUNY IRB. And this is a hybrid institution. Uh, in, in that the each college has an HRPP coordinator who is familiar with what's going on at the college, but the overall policies and procedures and the electronic systems are managed centrally. So, um, and the full board, the greater than minimal risk research is reviewed centrally. So, uh, and the uh, CITI training, which many of you may have already taken if you're going to be doing human subject research and the courses that you've already taken get counted under CITI so that um, you just have to take the few that might be specific to CUNY to satisfy our requirements. And so the first point of contact is your college HRPP coordinator, and then I am the uh, RIC team contact along with Lisa Peralta. So the take home message here is that if you think you might, if you know you're going to be doing research with human subjects, then you submit to the IRB. If you think you might, you submit to the IRB. If you don't even know what any of these terms mean, then you contact your HRPP coordinator. Research agreements. Research agreements cover a wide range of types of agreements. The important point is that you don't sign them yourself. CUNY has to sign. When you have an agreement, you're not having the agreement as a person or your department chair doesn't sign, it's CUNY. And there's a uh, matrix on this web page that shows you um, what to do, where to find the agreements, uh, who to submit them to, who needs to sign them. Um, and ex so examples of a research agreement might be a data use agreement. For example, um, if you did research at a previous institution and you want to just keep working on that research information, it's owned by a previous institution. So what we have to do is have a data use agreement so that uh, CUNY can accept that data uh, from your institution and everything is agreed on um, and in writing. So um, there, sometimes they might have, so, so question, does research agreement include collaborative research agreement? Yes, that's a, also a very um, common type. So um, these are pretty much any time you're involved with something and they say, here, sign this so we, you can do research, you don't sign it. You go to our website and you figure out what kind of research agreement it is and how to process it. Um, and there, each college has a research agreement point person and our RIC team contact is Tenzina Khan. Research integrity um, is kind of an overarching term um, the obligation, as I say, you probably started learning about this right way to do the scientific method in fourth or fifth grade, conduct research with integrity, mentor students and junior faculty in ethical research. It's kind of an apprenticeship system that you learn by watching other researchers act with integrity. Um, and it's also important that um, you know, we're a very small office. We can't be everywhere. We can hardly be anywhere. So that we have to count on all people doing research to 
um, understand their obligation to report suspected research misconduct, which is plagiarism, data fabrication, or data falsification. Each college has a research integrity officer, and um, I am the RIC team contact along with Linda Mules, uh, who's the University of Executive Director of Research Integrity and Compliance and is actually at a meeting of the Association of Research Integrity Officers, which is why I'm speaking today. Sponsored projects. Uh, this is the compliance part of sponsored projects, and it's we partner with the Office of Research and uh, the Research Foundation. Uh, one of the big initiatives is that we are transitioning to a, an electronic grant system, which will make things easier to, uh, to communicate and for pre-award and non-financial post-award functions. And it's coming in late 2024 um, or early 2025. For the sponsored projects or college grants officers, uh, in terms of compliance, are your first point of contact. And the RIC team contact, um, particularly for the Caillou system, is Yvette Duran and Kofi Ose. And then, again, sort of overarching function of the RIC team is training in research ethics. We manage the online CITI training. We also conduct in-person workshops for students and faculty, either uh, like a general research integrity uh, training, which is going to be next month, um, and also individual ones. For example, um, Ron arranges that the undergraduate mentors get a uh, not in person, but at least a live training in the uh, all of the things that we, we were just talking about with research integrity. Um, there are resources. Uh, it's a long URL, but if you click on it, because there are a lot of resources for learning about research uh, integrity training. And then uh, we have professional development for administrators, um, orientations, meetings, trainings, and again, um, additional resources. So we train you and we also uh, train the trainers. And this is just a slide with the, um, with the RIC team. Everybody was mentioned in a uh, particular area or more than one area on the previous slides. And then uh, these are some links. There's the Council of Administrators for Research Success, um, community grants officers, college conflicts officers, export control administrators, HRPP coordinators for IRB matters, reach agreement point persons, and then research integrity officers. And each one of these uh, has a representation from a college. So if you click on these links, uh, look for your college for the right contact. Um, and that's it. And so I'm going to turn it back over to Rose. So thank you, Fanny. I'm going to try to wrap it up um, in the next 15 minutes or so. And um, if there are questions, then then we can address those questions. And but I do want to say a few more things. First of all, about Cayuse. Fanny mentioned Cayuse being a, a it's a CUNY wide electronic research administration system. So you will, if you have not heard of Cayuse before, you'll hear more about Cayuse this fall. And it's a way in which PIs and grants officers can submit proposals, but it also, so it streamlines and simplifies the proposal submission process, but it also helps us better manage our compliance activities as Fannie was, was noting. So, um, outside interests, unfunded research agreements will initially be part of CALUS that's rolled out in the in the fund, but human ethics, human safety, animal oversight, those activities will be a part of the future CALUS. What One of the things that Fanny reminded me to say, and maybe I don't need to say this, is that 
proposals, research proposals are submitted by the institution. They're not submitted by the PI. The awards are made to the institution. The awards are not made to the PIs. So that's the reason with the compliance issues, everything has to be signed by CUNY. The PIs are not making obligations for the institution. The institution makes the obligations for the institution. So the PI may be um, the administrator for the award. You may, you may act on behalf of CUNY, but the awards are made to CUNY. And we all we sometimes run into questions about, um, you know, um, this is this is my award. The PI has received the award. Um, I should do what I need with the award. It's actually CUNY has received the award, and it's also sometimes we run into problems where faculty submit proposals or at least attempt to submit proposals directly to funding agencies. The, the proposals are submitted by the institutions. So your grants offices should submit all proposals and CAIUSE will help us in terms of implementing this. So it will reduce administrative burdens on the faculty. It'll lower the ba barriers to research It'll protect the university assets better and pre-award and non-financial post-award transaction time should be decreased. And it's gonna bridge the gap between the colleges and RF CUNY. We've spoken a lot about RF CUNY, but I don't think we've really, if you're not familiar with RF CUNY, you um, may not know what we're talking about. So in these last few minutes, I'm going to try to say something about RF CUNY, but I'm also going to uh, address some of these last bullets on the agenda. Grants offices. So you've heard Fannie talk about it. You should get to know your grants offices. They are the first point of contact regard regarding research. Um, we the CUNY Office of Work Research work closely with the grants offices, but those are the, the initial points of, of contacts for the faculty, for the staff, for the students. They're really experts in proposal submission processes. So if you have questions about, are you eligible for this opportunity? Um, how do I submit? That's where the grants office comes in. They represent the PI relative to the Research Foundation. Still got to tell you about that. And they're, in terms of additional uh, guidance, if they're unsure, they will contact the CUNY Office of Research. But get to know your grants officers. Now, this is, this is another eye chart to say exactly who are your grants officers. But the idea is that every campus has a grants officer contact. And you can find this, as Fanny said, on the CUNY Research website. Here's the link. CARS, we have a council of administrators for research success. They're generally the um, maybe associate provost for research, dean of research at your individual campuses. And we meet monthly and they serve as an advisory council to us for the CUNY Office of Work Research. And we discuss research topics that a wide range that are relevant across CUNY. And it's really an additional resource if you on a campus have research questions, you can contact your CARS member. And these members are also noted on the website. Now, I took this snap picture of the website, and you'll see my name here, if you can read it. I'm no longer at City College, but the website has been updated since then. Um, this position is actually kind of open now, but check the website for your CARS member. They are a resource as well, if you have questions. Let's finally talk about this thing called the Research Foundation. Um, the Research Foundation is actually CUNY's fiscal agent for grant administration. 
So when an award is received by CUNY, it's actually administered by the Research Foundation. So CUNY does not administer research awards. The Research Foundation helps us out by doing that. So they're our fiscal agent. But they work closely with individual PIs because the RF oversees employment of your grant of your graduate students or undergraduate students or your postdocs because they're the bank. They manage those funds. And so they will help in hiring uh, people that may be associated with your, your awards. They are outstanding in terms of accounting, auditing, and reporting. CUNY doesn't worry about any of that. So Research Foundation handles the legal aspects of these awards, as well as the financial aspects of the awards. They're our partner in terms of managing research-related awards. They can negotiate agreements for us. They work with the government agencies and foundations. So you may have more interactions with the Research Foundation than you do with the Office of Research, but just know that we, the Office of Research, also interact with the Research Foundation. So they are our fiscal agent. They manage the funds so that, as I talked about for FY24, that $600 million, the Research Foundation manages that for us, for us as CUNY. Grantsmanship, people ask, you know, how can I be a better writer? Um, what can I do to improve my writing skills? We don't actually address that in the Office of Research. We don't necessarily have programs out there in terms of writing. Where I could send you is NORDA. It's the National Organization of Research Development Professionals. You may not want to be a research development professional, but this is a, a very good source of information in terms of grantsmanship, in terms of potential opportunities for funding. I just grabbed these three opportunities from Nordup exchanges. So if you were to become a Nordup member, you would also be able to have these uh, potential opportunities as a resource from their website, and also from their actual email communications. I recommend, even if you're not a research development professional, to look into NORDA. How to find grant opportunities. The research, uh, the um, Office of Research, we don't actually find grant opportunities for PIs. We ask, we, it's kind of like train the trainer. We teach you how to find those grant opportunities. Those databases are generally pivot and grant forward. So John Sapogas, who is the director of pre-award uh, uh, and pre-proposal support at RF CUNY is a fantastic resource to help find grant opportunities but they also conduct bi-weekly workshops to discuss grant opportunities. I've just listed a couple that are upcoming. So for instance, tomorrow, is that the 18th? Tomorrow, there's an NEA grants opportunity workshop that's being held from noon to 1 p.m. Webinars, all you have to do is sign up and, and, and there'll be information given about National Endowment for the Arts grant opportunities for fiscal year 25 for you know upcoming opportunities. There's actually a pivot training workshop that's gonna be on October 2nd from noon to 1 p.m. This will be, um, I won't say a hands-on, but it will be a teaching opportunity to learn how to use pivot so Pivot is a database where you put in your keywords, you put in your research interests, and you can get emails that say such and such an opportunity is available. 
you may want to apply for. If you're a minority serving institution, you can put that in a keyword and it will send back, you know, it will it will search the uh, internet, it'll search the, the universe and send information back to these opportunities are available for minority serving institutions. These opportunities are available for Hispanic serving institutions. These opportunities are available for um, community colleges or four-year institutions, whatever your keywords are, whatever your research area is, uh, Pivot can be used to find those opportunities. And there's a Pivot training workshop um, on October 2nd. Grant Forward is the same thing. Pivot and Grant Forward are basically databases out there to find funding opportunities for all disciplines and all project types. This website here, this link here, goes to the bi-weekly workshops that are sponsored. And, and actually, um, you know, John Sapogas teaches a lot of them. I think I'm almost done here as a finally. Um, upcoming Office of Research events. So you heard Alan She talk about the CUNY NYSTEC Entrepreneurial Workshop that's being held the 27th. I think there's a link if you're interested. I think there's a link that he presented. We also have collaborations with University of Ghent. So it's called UGENT, but it's actually G-H-E-N-T, University of Ghent. We've got a collaboration opportunity set up on September 30th. Now this centers around public health, but we continue to foster these collaborations, not only within CUNY, but external to CUNY as well. So this is just one example. We will, CUNY of Office of Research will hit the road. We're going to start um, rolling out our strategic plan. Um, our strategic plan goes for 2030, goes to 2030, but we're start talking about what are we gonna do in the 24, 25 upcoming um, academic or fiscal year. We're starting to roll those out in October. We'll also um, have sessions in spring of 2025. So keep a lookout for those and you'll hear more about the Office of Research. And finally on this slide, there's a new faculty reception. Don't know if the information has gone out yet, but mark your calendars. This is um, CUNY-wide for new faculty members. It's a reception that's being held, I think it's at the Graduate Center, I can't say for sure, but um, it's on November 19th from 6 to 8 p.m. The Chancellor will be there. I'd highly recommend that you uh, think about attending the new faculty orientation. You'll get a chance to meet some of the people on the call today, as well as people from across CUNY who are new faculty. I think this is my last slide. I hope you have received this as well. Um, we, the CUNY Office of Research, is um, we're distributing what we call Research in Focus as an electronic research magazine. Um, it's replacing lab meeting, but our first issue will be in October of 2024 and it will be distributed CUNY-wide. The goal is to highlight the research activities across CUNY. So, um, you know, as a spoiler alert, this first issue will be uh, centered on breast cancer research throughout CUNY. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So we will highlight at various institutions across CUNY, the breast cancer research that's ongoing. Each month we'll have a different theme. And so we would like, and we're always open to suggestions about research that's ongoing throughout CUNY that we can highlight. So if, if you have a particular research interest or a research area, we'd love to hear about it. And I think that's it. I don't know why I don't have a question slide, but questions. Um, I will stop sharing. I think there may be questions in the chat, but 
we're we're open for questions. Uh, Christina, do you want to handle? So Rhiannon Nielsen asked, what if you're a non-U.S. working as faculty at CUNY? Do you count under export control? Fanny, you want to take that? Uh, yes, I, I believe so. Certainly, um, either you can message me directly or um, I will ask Angela to get in contact with you. So Sergio Grassi asks, what are the limitations in general to apply to these and other funds for us who are citizens of other countries? So it's actually um, solicitation or RFP specific. Um, I'm going to ask Sergio. I'm going to ask Alan, you want to take that one? Can you ask the question again? I'm sorry. What are the limitations in general to apply to these and other funds for us who are citizens of other countries? So for the external uh, funding opportunities, um, usually, so long as you are faculty, the grants uh, will not have the restrictions. There are some restriction on some particular funding up, um agencies such as the DOD and NASA, um, some programs might have the citizenships restriction. And also they might impose the restriction on whom uh, the students uh, nationalities requirement as well. So for those spatial type um, projects, then nationality certainly will be um, an issue and certainly uh, you, when you read the RFPs um, request for proposal documents, the solicitation documents, you need to uh, look at the eligibility and the restrictions. But for NSF and NIH, um, most of the grants will not have the nationality restrictions. And sorry, if I can just add something about export control. So export control isn't anything going to a non-US person. It's very limited to things that might be for Department of Defense or counterterrorism mm -hmm. technologies or information. And um, so it's not, um, you need to check to make sure that there's none of that involved, but most research doesn't involve that. So it wouldn't impact the fact that you're not a US citizen. Right. Does research agreement include collaborative research agreement? Yes, that's a um, prime example of the type of agreement that would come to the uh, RIC team. So, and, and I'm going to reiterate what Fanny said earlier. Um, coming from a, a campus, a local campus, there's sometimes confusion as to who signs these research agreements. Can I sign it as a PI? Can my department chair, can my dean, can my uh, provost sign it? And the answer is no. The answer is CUNY signs it. So if there are any questions about any kind of agreement, you can first, as Fanny said, go to your grants office but they should also contact CUNY to ask questions about where does this research agreement go? Because I will say, Fanny, that it is confusing sometimes, but you look at the chart on, on the website and that'll help you out. But some research, some agreements go to the TCO, some agreements go to um, um, our, to, the, to, to Linda and, and Fanny's group. Um, some agreements, uh, financial agreements have to go to the RF because they're financial and CUNY only handles non-financial. So I go, ah, but there is a chart that will, will help lead you through these agreements. And that's actually a very good, um, good topics to talk about right here is that, uh, keep in mind that, um, the grants or the fundings come into institutions, 
not to you as the even though you are the PI principal investigator, you wrote the application, you wrote the proposal, you got the funding. It is actually the institution who is the awardees. It's not you as the awardees. And um, in terms of the signing signatories uh, authorities, indeed, uh, um, faculty, you will not be the one who signed for anything, not even the non-disclosure agreements when you want to talk to somebody about the research collaborations. Any additional questions, Christina? Said, oh. uh, who can we contact if we have a research project that could turn into a possible enterprise to preliminary to preliminarily discuss the possibilities? Are you talking about the that you have some technology that you might spin off a company? Yeah, I'm um, uh, I'm working. My research project is about uh, best practice on uh, prison education, correction, and reintegration around the world. Then uh, it can be like uh, possible to de develop like an idea, but um, it's very new for me. Then uh, yeah, maybe yeah. So I so that will be um, about. Mm -hmm. That will be the technology commercialization office, or myself if, if you want to, um, Doug. Adams, who make the presentation about the TCOs, uh, he will okay. be the one who that you should contact about the intellectual property. And by the way, also for the new faculties, whatever you discovered uh, and you want to have a patent out of that, it is not that you be the one who apply for the patent. It should be the CUNY who yeah, yeah, yeah. apply for the patents. But uh, for, for the start, uh, for the zero point, for start to think about this, it will be you, Alan, a dog. Yeah, or, you, or, 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 and yeah, John, or, a dog. Yeah. yeah, or Doug Adams that you should talk to. Okay, John, thank, you. thank you. John, you were raising your hand. John Blaho, you want to say something on here? Sergio, you should take our uh, training course, introductory training course that's happening in January. Okay. So, then and, and thank you. Thank that'll, you. That'll help you a lot, especially with yeah, the conversations absolutely. with uh, Doug. Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you. Yep. Good luck. Effie, you have your hand up. I um hold up. Oh yes, I do. <laughs> and my and I'm unmuted. I just want to sort of qualify um some of the things that you know that Rose said in terms of the role of the research foundation. I mean, speaking as a grants officer and also a principal investigator, I just want to make it clear to you that. When you, re you receive a grant, and yes, as Alan said, the funding comes to the institution, it comes to the university, holds the grant, but you, the way that the accountability structure works, if you're a principal investigator, you are responsible for most of the grant oversight. So, so I, I just want to let you know that if you receive a grant, it's not just like, oh, the Research Foundation is taking care of it and they do everything. You still have to... <laughs> perform a project management role. You still have to maintain accountability. You still have to do all your own reporting. It's just that the Research Foundation helps you manage that award and also make sure that you're in compliance. So right. I, I just wanted to, you know, again, it's not, we partner with, with with the Research Foundation, but that doesn't mean that you still don't need to have an active role in managing all of your grants. And that's also in partnership, as, as Rose had mentioned, with your sponsored research office on your campus, who also take a very active role in managing all of your grants. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. So to add to that, um, I will say um, there's a difference between a grant and a contract. Mm -hmm. And Sometimes new faculty and more experienced faculty don't understand the difference. Um, so a grant is used is something like from the National Science Foundation or NEH, a grant that comes in. And so you've proposed to do X, Y, and Z, and we all know research changes. So over the three years of this award, I might have said I was going to do X, Y, and Z, but after the first year, the second year, I've talked to my program director and the 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 direction has kind of changed. I think I might have been a little bit starry-eyed when I made the proposal. 
And I thought I was going to go to the moon, but now I'm only able to go to Jersey, you know, and, and so with a grant, as long as you're talking with the funding agency, as long as you're talking with your program directors, people generally say, oh, okay, Jersey, I understand. It's, it's kind of tough to get there, especially at rush hour. I understand. But with a contract, you said you were going to do X, Y, and Z, and you were going to make it to the moon in three years. Well, then the contract that CUNY has signed or RF has signed on your behalf says that you're going to the moon. And if you make it to Jersey, that's good, but that's not good enough. So there's a big difference between a contract and a grant. And when you accept those awards, you should realize the difference between the two. Team, anybody else want to add to that? And there is another category called cooperated agreement, uh, which is a different level of um, things. But uh, anyway. Yeah. Now I see in the chat, um, at least I saw somebody was asking about who do we contact for interdisciplinary research? <laughs> I won't make a joke. Alan, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, Ron and Effie, certainly uh, they have a lot of um, programs and uh, certainly you can contact them as well, or myself as well. Um, just uh, as I mentioned in my briefly in my uh, presentation, we are also trying to facilitate the interdisciplinary research um, discussions uh, between faculties, CUNY faculties, and team science is one of the workshops that we just held uh, last week. And we will continue to uh, have more events similar to that so that we will have um, different disciplines of uh, faculties to come together and then be able to get to know each other and talk about some uh, collaborations. So I will put my email in there as well. So I also see one question, maybe you guys have already answered it. Can we have a list of workshops? So in the slides, um, I, the, the uh, webinars, I think is what, uh, what John Sapogas calls what he does. That link in, in, um, in one of the slides will take you directly to the PDF that outlines the biweekly webinars that are, are, um, are conducted by um, John Sapogas and his team. And I, I highly recommend that you, you take a look at those and um, you know log on when you're available or if, if one of those interests you. And I just say, I just want to quickly thank you all for the great team science um, workshop that was on Friday. I was able to attend and I just wanted to just give a shout out to how wonderful of a day it was and how much I appreciated the opportunity and just give a recommendation to everyone here for future opportunities like that. So thank you so great. much. Thank you. So we hope to do more of that. Um, that's one of the things that, that we'd like to promote throughout CUNY is that we know we have silos in departments on campuses, but it's even magnified even greater between campuses. So what we're trying to do is break down some of those silos, get people to talk to one another, get people to work with one another. And when I go out externally and talk about CUNY, People say, oh, what a, what a fantastic opportunity that you've got 25 different campuses within the city of New York. But do you realize how far away the <laughs> College of Staten Island is from the Bronx? I mean, you know, so even though we're all in the city of New York, we still have barriers that prevent the, the collaboration, the communication, just the interactions. So, but we could be so much greater, I believe, once we talk to one another. 
So thank you. That's that's what we're trying to do. Okay, Mr. Mr. Thank you for the encouraging words. Any other questions? Any other um, topics? If not, uh, again, thank you for your time. Um, welcome to CUNY. And feel free to reach out to any of us if you have additional questions. And best wishes on a successful career here at CUNY. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. See you. Thank you. See you have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay. So I don't know if we need to debrief or if we can talk about what we need to do better. Do you want to stop recording? Yes. And